Uh, do you want me, Bob, do you want me to say something about Christmas at some point or not? Oh, yeah, we will, yeah. But you let me know when? Oh, maybe? yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Hometown Cable. Our program's called What's Going On Here? My name is Bob Venn, Calvin Castine with the camera. And again, we're in a familiar table and chairs, and we're in Ogdensburg, New York, to meet our new bishop. I say new. He's been here for two years. Bishop uh, Paul Laverde. Did I, did I say that right? You Laverde? did, Bob. Thank you know, when you. you first came, I didn't know how we were going to pronounce your name, but we, we heard it in... in, in Yes. Uh, what other ways do you hear it besides Laverty? Oh, I hear Laverty <laughs> and Laverty. And yes. That, of course, uh, you could do it in one way that's really Italian. Of course, it's an Italian name. It is an Italian name. And if we really wanted to be just precise, mm -hmm. it would be Loverde. Laverde. Loverde. Loverde. Yes. Is that the original spelling, the way it is? Yes. 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 In fact, I think uh, people in Sicily, my father's uh, relatives, but it probably had a capital V, L O and a capital V. Okay, it's L O V E R D E. -R -D -E. D -E. Means the green one. The, we talked about coming down. We yeah. wondered what the nationality. Yeah. We wondered green, you yeah. know, but that's usually V E R T. Yeah. Uh, that'd be in French. French. Okay. That's right. That's All right. right. We wondered if that might so. be. Well, did we have um, a, a Father Green? Uh, oh, I wouldn't say Greenwood. Uh, where is that, Bob? And where is Altona, there? I think he's in. Um, huh? Bravair. That's it. Greenwood. Greenwood. That's yes. Right. Bravair. Yes, Bravair that's it. Bravair is All Greenwood. Right. That's so, right. So who was from Italy? Your father or your grandfather? You know, my father was born in Sicily, and my mother's parents were born in Sicily. So my whole background is Sicilian. Okay. So your father came over to the yes, United States? Yes, my father came over in 1920. He was uh, around 16 then. With his family? No, he came by himself. That's, and, that's, that's uh, frightening. And went to find relatives in Buffalo. So that's why I have relatives uh, and a connection with Buffalo, New mm -hmm. York, because that's who he came to first. Didn't like the winters in Buffalo. So he moved down to New York and worked in New York City in the area for a while. Finally moved over into Connecticut and over to New London, and then met my mother and then settled down. They got married in 1930. And uh, he, my mother, lived in a little place at the edge of Connecticut, Rhode Island, called Pawkatuck, Connecticut. And that's, in fact, where I grew up. Did, uh, was she Italian, too? Yes, yeah, she was Sicilian, but she was born here. Her parents had come over from Sicily. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you have these nationality clubs and so forth where they very well could have met? I think they met at work. At work? Yeah, they were both textile workers. Uh -huh. And I think that's where they first met. Uh, in, in the mill. Okay. Yeah. And you have a big family? No, I'm the only child. Uh, the Were only you spoiled? No. No, you weren't spoiled. No, my mother saw to that especially. <laughs> I think my father would have spoiled me. Uh, I, I think so. He was uh, more easygoing in many ways. Mm -hmm. My mother was a very good disciplinarian and she saw to it that I was not spoiled. So, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, you learned to work when you were young? I did. Yes. Um, my father, um, he worked in the mill, of course, but we had, uh, we had a large pl uh, plot of land. Uh, Eastern Connecticut, by the way, is very much like the North Country. Lots of small towns and small villages and um, dairy farms and agriculture. Now, I lived in a small town, I think, probably when I was growing up, Pocket Duck had about maybe 3,000, 4,000 people. And my dad had a, big, you know, we had a big yard and he had a big garden and he also had a chicken coop with chickens, and uh, he had a small little business. He maybe he had a dozen customers. But I remember on Saturday, you know, going with him to deliver the, the eggs. Well, you sold eggs? Yes, yeah, part-time there. Did I you like taking care of chickens? Not a lot, but I helped him. Nothing I hated worse. I grew yeah. up on a farm, and yeah. I hated chickens. Yeah. Yeah. But my stepfather used to say, you don't mind eating the eggs, though, do you? Right. <laughs> but then, uh, as I went into high school, I began, uh, when I was able to work, when I was old enough to work, I took on one summer a, uh, a job. My first job was washing dishes in a restaurant. And I stayed there maybe a year and a half. And then after high school, I began to sell shoes. And, uh, you mean door to door? No, um, in down in Tom McCann's. Uh -huh. And I worked there a couple of summers. And then my last three summers when I was in the seminary in college, I uh, delivered mail at the beach. So uh, I had a variety of jobs, but I worked. Mm -hmm. I always help my parents, too, with, with the house, you know, and help mom mm -hmm. with the housework. Now, I um, don't usually have anything I can look, look through or anything like that, but I did go through 
the North Countryman, uh, the North Country Catholic, back when you were coming. And apparently you knew very, very young that you thought you wanted to be a priest, quite young. Yes, I, it's a story I tell a lot these days because I'm going Please around <laughs> visiting, um, as you may know, the, in this uh, fall season, going into the winter now, I'm going around at what we call the Operation Andrew Dinners. These little get-togethers, part of it is a dinner, in which I'm inviting the priests of our diocese to bring to meet me any young men in their parish that they think might be suitable candidates for the priesthood. And that we call them Operation Andrew Dinners because named after St. Andrew, who brought Pete, his brother Peter to Jesus. Any case, at those dinners I tell this story. I was about seven when my cousin in Buffalo, I mentioned my, my connection mm -hmm. to Buffalo. Well, my cousin was ordained in 1947. His name was Michael Juvino. And I remember him, his coming down to Pawkatuck with his parents. And I was about seven, as I say. And I was so impressed with him, you know, um, whatever. He was just so wonderful that I said to my parents ever since then, I was saying to them, I want to be like Father Mike when I grow up. And then I had some wonderful priests in the parish. We had a wonderful pastor. He was probably there over 40 years as pastor. He was a pastor when my mother was in grammar school, and he was a pastor after I was ordained a priest. So you can see he stayed a long time. But he was a wonderful influence, and the other priests in the parish in the area. So yes, I, I felt God was calling me to be a priest from early on. That's not true of everyone, mm -hmm, no. but it was true in my case. But you told your parents that too. Oh, I did, yes. And their advice to me was to do whatever I thought was best for me. They didn't want to push me and be a priest. They didn't want to discourage mm -hmm. me either. And the advice I got all the time was, if this is what you think God is asking, this is how you're going to be happy, we support you. In fact, I can tell you I was about oh, three months before being ordained, my mother sent me a letter. I was then, by then, in Rome studying, and she sent me a letter, and she said, remember now, your father and I want you to do what's best for you, and even now, if you think you are not being called, please come home. The door is open, we love you, whatever you do. So, I never felt any pressure, but I felt a lot of support, mm -hmm. which I think is exactly what, what parents should do today, mm -hmm. to encourage their children to enter religious life, as a priest, a brother, or a sister, not, not discourage them. Sometimes we find that. That's, that's a new phenomenon lately, that a lot of parents will, will positively discourage their sons or daughters. I would say don't discourage them, encourage them. Uh, you don't want to force them, but you can certainly encourage them. You must have heard over the years that uh, I know numerous or several nuns who told me, sisters who said, that they promised their mother on her dying bed that they would become a sister, oh, and I, they didn't want to. Oh. But they promised their mother, and now they felt they must stay. Until they got to a point in their life, they said, I don't think I have to do that. And they left because they did it for their yeah. parents. I had never heard French. of that story. That's interesting. Uh, several, okay. several I could okay. name. That's a new one for me. Is I that right? Yes, I had not heard Particularly that. in Canada, okay. the French yeah. were very strong. Okay. Were you an altar boy? Oh, yes. Oh, you were? I became an altar boy uh, in the fourth grade and stayed all the way through the end of high school. Uh, uh, you know, I tell people that... Uh, People who were watching me are going to say I was lying. Now. I told them that I was going to be a priest, but I couldn't learn my Latin and I had to stop it. As soon as I got married, they went to English, I could be a priest. Now. Say that. <laughs> and they, and they, and they, they said, is that true? And I say, no, it's not true. <laughs> but we were the altar boys. And yes. I tell you, some priests are great examples. Yes. Well, that's what I found. See. Yes. Absolutely. So we'll take a short break while we're talking about examples and we'll come right back. You're watching Hometown Cable and the smiling gentleman, that both of us, Bob Venn. Father Paul, uh, Father Bishop Paul, uh, Stephen Laverde. Right. Be right back. Of course, we're just chatting to start off. First of all, I had read where I thought you were born in uh, Pawtucket. It's not called Pawtucket, no, is it? No, it's Pawkatuck. Pawkatuck. Is yes. that a different place than Pawtucket? It is. Pawkatuck okay. is in Connecticut. All right. Pawtucket's and, in Rhode Island. Okay. I also started to write the word out, and I was typing here, Ottawa that you had uh, the titular uh, Bishop of Ottawa. Then I found it's O-T-T-A-B-I-A. How yes. do you say that? Otabia. Okay, yeah. well, those are two di different names I got oh, yeah. wrong. Right, two right, different right. places in the Absolutely. world. Absolutely. All right, so you yeah. graduated in high school in? No, I went to, uh, what I did is I went to parochial school uh -huh. in Pawkatuck. Yeah. A parish school, St. Michael's, uh, from kindergarten to eighth. Then I wanted to go to a Catholic high school. We didn't have any very close. But, well, I knew I wanted to go to a Catholic high school because I wanted to get Latin because I wanted to be a priest. 
So what I did is I went over to, uh, across, uh, across the little river that divides the two states into a place called Westerly, Rhode Island, and they had a junior high. So I got one more year of Catholic school in at Immaculate Conception Junior High. And then I was able to get into LaSalle Academy in Providence, Rhode Island, and every day I went up on the train. It was an hour up, 10 minute Community. bus ride. Oh, yeah. Went to class, got on the bus, 10 more minutes to the train station, hour back to that for three years. But I was educated there by the Christian brothers, the ones founded by St. John Baptist de LaSalle. Mm -hmm. Had a wonderful, uh, wonderful education there, it was great. Then from there, I went to uh, the seminary college. And in those days, they were the first two years of that seminary college um, took place in a seminary called St. Thomas in Bloomfield, Connecticut, a suburb of Hartford. Um, our Wadhams Hall here in Ogdensburg has four years of college all in one place. Mm -hmm. But in those years, two years of college were in one place, and then you had to go two more. So my first two years were in St. Thomas and Bloomfield. Then I went to Rochester, New York, at St. Bernard Seminary, for two more years. And at the end of those four years, I got a degree, BA, mm -hmm. in philosophy. And I was intending to go on and do theology at St. Bernard's, because that would be the normal thing, to stay on then for four more years when um, the bishop of our diocese, the Diocese of Norwich in Eastern Connecticut, Bishop Hines, he invited me to go to Rome to study. So I went over to Rome, and I was four years in Rome, and then I was ordained a priest in Rome at St. Peter's Basilica, and then came back to the Diocese of Norwich and began working. So you were ordained in Rome? I was. When you go to Rome for that four years, is uh, you have to pay something? Are your parents paid for you attend? Uh, we paid part of it, and the diocese put in the other as a loan, and then mm -hmm. after ordination, I paid back the loan. Mm -hmm. when, there's some snow coming out there now. There is. Oh, he's really blowing. Um, when you were in uh, high school, yes. uh, what did you do for extracurricular activities in school? Okay. Any sports? Any uh, debate? I was never great in sports. I, I don't know why that is. Somehow, I think, first of all, my father was not a great sportsman, so I didn't pick it up from him. And as a, as a child, I was interested, but I had one of those um, interesting, um, in some ways, uh, uh, interesting, I guess, and it, my eyesight was not the best as a kid. Now, I had glasses ever since I was in kindergarten, uh, but we lived in a small town, as I told you, and therefore the, uh, the, uh, the availability for people uh, to treat was, was limited. So we went to a doctor who got me glasses at, in kindergarten. And it was only when I finished eighth grade that I realized that we had the wrong prescription. He meant well, I'm sure, but he it wasn't the precise prescription. Because I went to a new doctor, he said, you have a lazy eye, and I never knew that. And, but then it explained to me what had happened in my youth when I was a young boy. Um, for example, I'd go up to the plate to, to hit the ball. Well, the ball would go by me and then I'd hit. Well, after a while, when you're kind of this kind of a klutz, you know what I mean, <laughs> not being the best kind of a player, nobody wanted me. And the I last one to be chosen? Well, I could hear them whispering. I could hear them, you know. <laughs> so I think all of that coalesced. I, I wasn't good at any of the sports, so all of that coalesced, and I really didn't get interested in sports. Uh -huh. But I did have extracurricular, extracurricular activities. Um, I liked being on the newspaper, uh -huh. and eventually I became editor-in-chief of the high school newspaper. And um, I didn't go out running track, but I did some running on my own during mm -hmm. high school. And um, I was also in our vocation club, uh, so in the Latin club. So my, my, my extracurricular activities in high school were kind of uh, uh, club-like. They weren't in sports. But I got out and, uh, yeah. Well, part of your extracurricular was getting back and forth to home oh, yeah. an hour and ten minutes. That's, oh, yeah. That's... oh, yeah. With once in a while uh, being sleepy on the way home, and uh, mm -hmm. twice I almost didn't get off. At that the right, right place. Yeah, I woke up at the last minute, but I, I was able to. That's an expense in, in itself. It was. You know, my, my parents had to work hard, and I, that's why I, did. I got it. Did a your job. mother continue working after? She did. Mm -hmm. yeah, she did. And not immediately after I was born, but then she did. Because, mm -hmm. uh, uh, as you know, textile uh, salaries are not, are not too. Mm -hmm. no. too uh, and they, they've all closed up now and gone south? Those most mills, of them. Most of those mills, very huh? few mills left, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In her later years, um, my father kept on with the textile. Um, when I was probably in, um, oh, I'd say, probably fifth or sixth grade, my mother went to work for Bostitch. That's a company you know, that makes the staples. Yes, yes. And uh, initially they were located in Pawkatuck. And then when they moved, she herself traveled every day f for an hour, 45 minutes to an hour, by car to go to where the plant. Mm -hmm. And she, you know, but it was because of them and my work that we would afford 
what we could in terms of education. Now, when you were in and around the Hartford area, either before or when you became a priest, uh, were, the, were the parishes broke down by nationalities quite a bit? Where you had an Italian yes, section yes, and a French section? Yes, in Connecticut, there, there were a lot of national parishes, um, but, uh, it, particularly in the Archdiocese of Hartford. Now, um, I never lived in the Archdiocese of Hartford until I became an auxiliary bishop. In eastern Connecticut, we had the Diocese of Norwich, but there they also had uh, ethnic parishes. I would say they had maybe five or six Polish parishes, they had one Italian, that's where I ended up after ordination, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and probably seven, five or seven uh, French parishes. They did it in Plattsburgh. Plattsburgh had a French and the right. uh, Irish. That's right. And then the uh, well, a lot of your victory, I guess, was a combination. But you, you get to South Plattsburgh there, you know, and yeah. so forth. Yeah. All right, before, well, before you get out and get to become a priest, we'll take another short break. We'll have a commercial here, maybe. And don't go away, folks. We're coming right back. We'll be back. All right, according to the paper, you were ordained December 18th, pretty near your anniversary right now. Oh, yeah. You know what? Right. That's going to be 30 years. I know, 30 years. Uh, 18th, uh, 1965 at St. Peter's Basilica. Yes. You can't go much higher than that, can you? Uh, in Rome, Italy. And then what happened to you? Uh, well, I stayed six more months in Rome finishing my studies. Mm -hmm. I came home in July of 1966, and after a very brief assignment in the summer at one of the country uh, summer parishes called St. Agnes in Niantic, I was appointed to be the associate pastor at our only Italian national parish in the whole diocese of Norwich mm -hmm. at St. Sebastian's in Middletown. Oh, can I interrupt you here? Sure. When you went to Rome, were you destined to come back to a certain diocese? Yes, usually a, a man sir, uh, studies for a particular diocese, usually the one where he's born. Okay. Yes, so that I was, uh, I was to come back and serve in the diocese okay. of Rome. Okay, and, and, and how far was that from your home where your mom and dad were? Uh, about 18 miles. 18 miles? Yeah. You could get home for a good dinner once yeah. in a while. Yeah, because that's, that's, that's where the diocese was named. Yeah. Now, I could have served anywhere in eastern Connecticut. Okay. So I could have been, probably the farthest I could have been was an hour and a half. Okay. Yeah. A lot different from the diocese oh, yeah. of Ogdensburg. Yes, yes. And it was Paul and Mary. Yes. Yeah. My mother's name, was cause she was called Mary. Her, her baptismal name was Anne Marie. But um, no one ever called her that. And so she went always by Mary. Mary, huh? Yeah. Well, I think they, they seem to always go with that second yes. name, huh? Yeah, yeah, uh, my yeah. wife uh, is, everyone's known her as Teresa for years, but her name is Marie Teresa. Oh, yes. And I, I have here a picture. If you can get this picture, Calvin, and then a little, if you can freeze that in. Okay, what we're looking at. Bishop is oh, yes. your your Born, dad yes. on the left and yourself and uh, That's right. your mom. That's right. Uh, you look a lot like your dad. I do. You certainly do. And as I get older, I look more like him. <laughs> you do. People who know us say that. Well, yeah. that's because you only knew him when, when he was older. Yeah. Can you remember what your dad looked like when you were 10 years old? A little bit. Can you? Oh, it's sure. hard to remember time, back when yeah, they... Is, uh, is, uh, what yeah. year was this? Was an 80... This was, no, this was 65. 65, yes. Yeah. In 65 and when you were ordained. My father then, well, he was born in 1903, so in that picture he's 62. 62 years old? Yes. Okay. Yes, and uh, my mother was born in 1908, uh, 1999, I'm sorry, 1909. She was, um, she was uh, 56. Uh -huh. You had your smile there too, just yeah. as much as... Uh, and they were there and, and they went to Rome with some people, uh, your yes. family members and so yes. forth? Yes, yes. We had... Uh, a group of 17 people come, some relatives and some friends, uh -huh. from the area for my ordination. And uh, they came over and we spent some time in Rome. And then we went down to see my grandmother in Sicily, because she was still living, my That's father's. your father's mother? mother. Yes. Uh -huh. And had my, uh, one of my first masses was in Sicily on Christmas night. And then we made a little trip up into Switzerland, France, and England, and they went home when I went back to Rome. Was your grandmother very, very happy you were a priest? Oh, delighted, yes. I had prayed for that. Not that your mother and father weren't, but yes. you said, they said, you do as you want, Paul. Yes, yes. But your grandmother was, yes. you say, she prayed for oh, it. Oh, yeah, huh? she did. She prayed that, uh, that I would persevere uh -huh. and that she would live to see me ordained. She was elderly. Yes. She was, let's see, I would say at that point, she was about 85. Uh -huh. yes. 
-hmm. She didn't get to the Ordination. No, couldn't she couldn't. Ordination. Some of the relatives from Sicily came up, but she was uh -huh. too elderly. Okay. That's why we went down. Yeah. Right. So you got back then to uh, Connecticut, and you uh, you served in the Norwich? In the Norwich Diocese. Yeah, okay. And my first place was at the Italian parish. Mm -hmm. Just two of you there, the pastor and no, the assistant? two assistants. Two. They yeah. don't dare call them assistants today. No. We no. can't do that today, no, can we? call we? them parochial vicars. Parochial vicars. Yes. But Which you were an assistant. Yes, I was an assistant, <laughs> an associate, sure. Um, there were two of us there, and I also had an additional responsibility. I was part-time chaplain at Wesleyan University uh, while I was the associate or the assistant at St. Sebastian's. And um, that was my first assignment. It lasted three years. Mm-hmm. And you stayed when you were at the uh, uh, Wesleyan all this time? Yeah, I was, no, I was, um, I was for three years the associate pastor yes. at St. Sebastian's. Right. Uh, the first uh, two years I was at Wesleyan mm -hmm. as a part-time chaplain. Wesleyan wanted then to have full-time chaplains. The bishop was unable okay. to have me do that. So they hired a, um, a Dominican priest and he became mm -hmm. full-time chaplain. Mm -hmm. yeah. When you got that at Wesleyan, did, was someone recommended you to the bishop. The bishop didn't know you enough to know that'd be a good place for Paul Laverde, did he? Well, what I think is um, he knew my record, you know, my, mm -hmm. my record at the seminary, and um, there had been a custom of sending to Wesleyan one of the associates of St. Sebastian's who was fairly new, and so I fit into that category, mm -hmm. and I think that's what prompted him to ask me to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, now, uh, three years you said you were in that one parish? I was. Mm -hmm. Now, up here, we've noticed that many, uh, back in those days, five years was what they would give yes. somebody, you know? Yes. And then transferred. And you went on to where from there? From there, then the bishop asked me if I would um, teach in a Catholic girls' high school in New London and be the chairman of the religious studies department and live in a parish. Um, but I was, my duties in the parish were only on the weekends. My main duty was to teach. And your day off in school. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So I went down, I went down to St. Bernard's Girls Catholic High School in New London, Connecticut. And I was there for, let's see, three years. And then we merged. At that point, the bishop had to merge several schools. And then I went on from there to the merged school, the new St. Bernard High School in Uncasville, which was then co-ed. And I was... Um, um, head of the religious studies department there, um, but I was not the chaplain. I had been the chaplain as well in the girls' school. Another priest was the chaplain at the new merged school. While I was there in New London, though, I also was the chaplain at Connecticut College and began uh, doing work on the, uh, continuing that work on the campus ministry as I had done some mm -hmm. at Wesleyan. Was this a happy time for oh, you? Oh, wonderful. Huh? You, it was? Enjoyed it. Oh, yeah. It sounds like all your time was oh, happy. Oh, I've enjoyed but everything you I've have, done. You have, you yes, have. I have. Yeah. So you wouldn't change anything you no, can think back no. to? Um, I did teach religion at a period in time in our history when it was real tough to teach young people. I mean, I can remember many a class where mm -hmm. the young people just didn't seem to want to respond to the class, you know. Mm -hmm. As much as I tried to be creative and, and interesting, you know, it was that... that we went through some tough times there in the mm -hmm. late 60s and early 70s. Well, but I still enjoy it. Okay, we know that there aren't many priests who become bishops. Right? They don't That's have the opportunity. That would be true. You knew you wanted to become a priest when you were seven. Yes. You, you thought so. You were looking up to looking your up cousin Lord, and yes, so forth. Sure. Uh, how long were you into the priesthood before you thought oh, you'd make a good bishop? Well, I really never thought about being you a didn't. bishop. No, you didn't. No, I, I, it's hard. I wanted to just be a good priest. Mm -hmm. So I still want to be a good priest, not a mm -hmm. good bishop. But mm -hmm. um, it, it's very different. I mean, to, uh, to be a priest was, was all I wanted. Mm -hmm. yeah. A bishop normally is as close to the flock as a priest is. Never is, is he, generally? Well, I think part of that is that when you're a priest, you're in a more um, a local area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you have the ability to get to know those people and enter their lives and share the Lord with them, you know, and you begin mm -hmm. to... When you're a bishop, first of all, you have a lot more responsibility in terms of administration. I mean, any pastor will tell you he has, he has a lot of mm -hmm. administration at the local level. Just multiply that by the, the, the number of parishes in the diocese. So that I find what happens when you're a bishop is that you, you can't get to be invested in people's lives the same way you did, because there are far more people now to mm -hmm. interact with, mm -hmm. far more responsibilities at the, at the administrative level. But what I want to keep in mind for myself, because I do love being with people, is that the office of bishop also has 
um, a, a very special place in the church, and that it's important that all of these responsibilities be attended to for the sake of all the other people. So while I miss maybe being in one parish and really getting to know those people deeply, um, I, I believe God's called me to do another work of service, which is, which is broader and, and larger, but nonetheless, very, very valuable, I hope. Okay. We'll take another short break and come back, and uh, we won't go through every parish that uh, the bishop was in, but we'll no. kind of see any important things before he became, he got the first word that he could become a bishop very soon. We've reached somewhere around 1970, 71, we're 72 here, but we aren't going to go through every year, Bishop. We want to cover some current things. But uh, up until 1988, when you learned you were going to be a bishop, what important or any special things happened to you that we should know about? Sure. Well, um, I, I certainly did 10 years worth of campus ministry. Worked at a couple of campuses. Uh, mm -hmm. I've already mentioned Connecticut College. But then I also, at the same time, began to take out responsibilities at... Um, Eastern Connecticut State College. That's what it was called at the time. Now it's called State University in Willimanta. Also during that time, I worked in the tribunal of the diocese, which is the church, church court of the diocese. And also began what to be... What does that mean? Church court? Yes. Well, there are, you know, the, the church is a society and people have rights. And any of those rights that uh, people have within the church society can be looked at, up, upheld, or, or defended, whatever in terms of, of, of a church system of, of justice. That's where canon law comes into play. Okay, we're talking Com now, marriage is a no. That's, that's probably, probably the, the, the most important thing. Uh, the one the we know about. Most thing, okay. yes. That's right. The most popular and frequent thing that a tribunal would do, mm -hmm. church court would do, would be the annulment of marriages, and I worked on that. Okay, how big of a group would that be, uh, that tribunal? Um, it varies from diocese to diocese. In Norwich, I think the uh, there was uh, probably one full-time person, everybody else was part-time. Oh. And are you on it for just a certain length of time? Or? A certain number of years, usually a five-year term. It can be renewed. Mm -hmm. So I was on that, and then eventually I went to Catholic University and got a degree in canon law. In Washington? Yes. Yep. And then came back, and then I was uh, the second in, com in, in command, the, the associate judicial vicar, we call him, of the tribunal. Okay. Who, uh, are you appointed or elected by your, your peers? I'm going to be appointed. To appointed the, by, the, by the bishop. The bishop. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I was on that. And then I was also far more involved in priest personnel matters. Served two times under Bishop uh, Riley um, in that in that uh, responsibility. So I had a lot of variety in well, my life. At that period, what you're telling me, if you weren't planning yourself, someone was planning for you to be a bishop. Well, that when you get so. into personnel, you're not talking about just a, a, a an assistant pastor. You're talking about uh, it's got to be one of the most biggest job you got. It is. Are your hundred and some odd priests yes. here? You personnel know? is absolutely. Very and the bishop does depend on, on those priests who have that responsibility. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I learned a lot in those years, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. And you were very close to the bishop, obviously. I worked very closely with him. Okay. I did. And there came a time here uh, after 1986, someone said, hey, this uh, Father Laverde could make a good... Uh, we never a Von Signer before? No. Never? No. Never no. didn't make that, huh? No. And uh, they tell me that's political. I don't know if that's no, true or not. That's so. not I political. Say that, but I don't think All right. So. Okay, no. we won't get into that. I don't uh, think so. When you get into, uh, now someone said, hey, we, uh, we want to consider you. Do you know they're considering no. you for a bishop? You don't know it. No. Okay. So no. what happened when the, you became, uh, uh, it said ordained a bishop, but you didn't have a diocese? No. What That's happened? Right. Well, what happened was that um, on the morning of uh, January 30th of 1988. Well, who, remem who remembered the date, oh, right? I do. <laughs> there are some things you, you never forget. Yes. But on that morning, I received a, a telephone call from the Pope's representative in Washington called the Apostolic Nuncio. At that time it was Archbishop Laghi. And he called me um, and said to me, the Holy Father uh, was intending to name me an, the Auxiliary Bishop of Hartford and a titular Bishop of Octavia, we had talked about that name earlier, would I accept? And that was the first um, awareness I had that I would be uh, being considered to be a bishop. Did he expect an answer right then? He did, right then. Come on. He did. He did. And I gave it. I'll think about it? No. He said to me, he said to me, you could think about it, but you see, even after doing that, it will come down to the same thing. The church desires that you serve, 
So yes. what is your answer? Yes, yes. And yes. so I said yes. Because I do believe, and I've said this then, I say it in terms of even coming to Ogdensburg, I believe God's will is made known to us through people in our lives, particularly through people who are legitimately over us. So when the Holy Father expresses that kind of wish, I really see that as God's will. If there was something very important that would stand in the way, I'd have to say that, but I, I didn't see anything that, that, uh, that, that would say that uh, this was not of God. Okay. Uh, so I said yes. Okay. There had been an auxiliary bishop of Hartford? There, there were two. And one of them, back in December of 86, had reached the mandatory age of 75, so he retired from being actively an auxiliary bishop. And um, then they began a search, and as, as I say, this, this news came in January of 88. So, so we're over talking about over, over, a over a year. Over a year, right. Yes. Then I was, so I became uh, the auxiliary bishop replacing that position. There was also another auxiliary bishop already. There. Okay, yes. so on January 30th, you said yes. I said yes. But that's like asking if you'll take a hand in marriage, you say you've got to go right away. Yeah. And then how long, what happened until... Well, April 12th of 88. Yeah. The, well, the, the news, news has to be kept quiet until oh, it's, quiet. It's, uh, it's announced publicly. Yes. And normally it would have probably been announced the next Tuesday. But the Archbishop of Hartford is away at a meeting. So we weren't going to announce it until February, I think it was February 9th. So the, um, the Pope's representative said to me that I was not able to tell anyone until the morning of February 9th. So from January 30th to February 9th, about 10 days, I could not tell a soul. That's I called did. a secret? It was can a, you, you can keep secrets? I can keep secrets. Oh, yeah. <laughs> As you can readily understand. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you must have been dying to tell your parents. Well, I was. My, by then, my father had died by that time. Oh, he had, yeah, my yes, father had died in 1980. 1980. This was eight years later. Yeah. But I wanted to tell my mother, and so I decided to go home the night um, before. And there had been a series of things on the last few days prior to my going home uh, that she began to wonder... First of all, she wondered why I was going to come home on Monday night when I no normally did not. And then Bishop Riley had wanted to get a hold of me a couple of times and had called me there. Um, and he had, he had usually he didn't have a chance to do that because I was in the office. To make a long story short, when I got home that evening, which would have been the evening of February 8th, um, and I got home late. I had told her to go to bed and she didn't want to go. But she said, something, something is up, she said. <laughs> and I said, no. Um, it's nothing that you need to concern yourself about tonight. And she said, well, there must be something. I said, no, you go to bed, <laughs> and tomorrow morning we'll talk about it. And I, I said it that way because I really wanted to respect what was asked of me yes. by the Pope's yes. representative, that I would not tell a soul until the morning of February 9th. Even though it was certain. Even though it was certain. Mm -hmm. but I respect that, mm -hmm. and I think when we're asked to keep a confidence, we must mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. I owe that. To anyone mm -hmm. who asks me to do Anybody that. out there. That's right. Same thing. That's right. When someone asks you for right. confidence, That's you know, right. you... you that isn't always it. observed in society, as you know. And lots yeah. of good people for sure. would be hurt. But anyway, make a long story short, um, I got up at about quarter of six, and I couldn't wait to tell her. You know. So um, I, um, I waited until six, and I knew that was now the time that had been announced, even though it would not be locally announced. I knew it had been announced in Rome and in Washington. So I went by her door and made some noise, and, and uh, she said, what time is that? I said, it's six. Time for you to get up. I said, <laughs> and I went in, and I sat down by the bed, and, and she, she really couldn't quite fathom, you know, what, what all this was about. And I told her that I know she had often said to me that she hoped she could live to see my 25th anniversary as a priest. Now, at that point, I was only uh, 22 years a priest. Right. So I said to her, I don't know if you're going to live three more years for the 25th, but you have lived uh, until today. And I had it all rehearsed, and all of a sudden I couldn't find any other words. So she looked at me, you know, like, well, what do you want to say? And I just couldn't get the words out initially. And finally I swallowed hard, and I said, well, you've lived today to know that the Pope's appointed me a bishop. Well, she cried, and I think I cried too. I was going to ask you those I tears. She cried, and I gave her a big hug. And and she said, oh, if only your father were here. And I said, well, Ma, he knew before you were me. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I was able to announce that to other mm -hmm. people, and then the news got out, and mm -hmm. well, she spent the whole day answering phone calls, and she was very elated. As a matter of fact, that was in the North Country, uh, Catholic of January 19th, 1994, yeah, which I keep a file. Uh -huh. 
and I went back and got this last night, and she said she got a lot of flowers and oh, uh, yeah, well did. wishes. Oh, she did. More than you did, probably, she huh? Always, they really did. She had a great day. The Italians are very, very proud. Yeah, they were very proud, and it was the first time that a priest of the Diocese of Norwich was named a bishop. Mm -hmm. And that was a, an added kind of thing. I suppose it's silly, but I should at least go by. Your, your mom and dad were churchgoers regularly. Oh, they were. I never yes, I, they really were. They were a good example to me. Uh -huh. they, find, you know, they, they lived their faith very quietly, but they did. Okay. Um, I suppose we've got, we're up to, uh, were, you, were you named two bishops at that time? The auxiliary bishop? I'm an auxiliary bishop, bishop? Of, of Hartford. And but if you're not the head of a diocese, a bishop is normally the head of a diocese. But we have situations where a bishop receives a helper. We call that an auxiliary bishop. Mm -hmm. Well, every bishop has to have a diocese somewhere. And so in, in the situation of auxiliary bishops, they give him the name of a diocese that no longer exists. So he's really, by title, the name of a, 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 the bishop of that diocese. So he's called titular bishop, by title. And usually these are dioceses that once existed and no longer do. Many of them are in South Africa, in uh, Turkey, in Syria, some parts of, of Europe. Uh, mine, they tell me, uh, no, the area no longer exists, but it had existed and probably now it's below some sand dune in, South a in North Africa, Atabia. Um, but recently, a number of di uh, former dioceses in the United States that no longer exist, their names have been given as titular sees. So we will probably see now some bishops who receive a titular see of a diocese that okay. was once in the United States. We're getting closer and closer to Ogdensburg. We'll be, we'll be going there when we get back. We'll, we'll come right back. You're watching Hometown Cable. Remember, uh, Hometown Cable is on every day five times. Uh, 12.30, 4.15, 8 p.m., midnight, and 8 the following morning. Five chances to see the same show. So if you didn't get the beginning of this or any other show, Watch for the next time, same thing, five different times, roughly three hours and a half uh, of different programming every day by Hometown Cable, Sam and Calvin Castein. Of course, if you're very close to your church and you, you read your Catholic papers and, you, and you're a Catholic, you know what the bishop does in a diocese. But what does an auxiliary bishop do in Hartford when you have a bishop? Well... What he does is assist that bishop in the various responsibilities. So the two of us uh, assisted first Archbishop Whelan, then he died, and when he died, Archbishop Cronin came. Um, the system was that each of us had a region, and um, we lived in that region. I lived in the region uh, over in the west and lived in the city of Waterbury. And initially there were 88 parishes in that region, in your region? Uh, 78, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, there were 78. Yeah. And then when we realigned <coughs> things, it went up to 120, I think. And my, my responsibilities were to, um, to be present to those parishes, to be available to the people and priests. And then another important dimension of the auxiliary bishop was to assist the, the head bishop, the diocesan bishop, with confirmations. Um, now, in the Archdiocese of Hartford, even though each bishop, auxiliary bishop, had his own region, we did the confirmation throughout the whole archdiocese, mm -hmm. and that gave everybody a, a, an awareness of the entire area. When you say you helped him, that don't mean you went to the same one that he was at. No. You went one and represented him. In other words, we, we uh, assisted him <coughs> in, the re in the responsibilities he okay. had. Yeah. Okay. So this is a real good training. Oh, it was excellent. I can't say to become a real, I was going to say a real yes. bishop. Well, you you are a bishop, just sure. like the bishop That's as right. you are now. Right. That's right. Uh, the title, everything is there, but you're just not in charge of a, of That's a diocese. Right. The difference is that you're not in charge. You're not the big boss. You're That's the, right. you're the you're assistant. In charge. That's All right. All right. And uh, they even don't call it assistant. They call it uh, auxiliary, auxiliary. It makes it sound better, doesn't yes, it? It does. Huh? It does. That's right. Okay. <laughs> so do most auxiliary bishops become bishops of a diocese? Yes. I would related? say most. Not all. Not all. I, I wouldn't want to. That's true that sometimes uh, there's a certain percentage the right opportunities probably would not come at some point, do you, but a good number of them do. Right, so you, you become a bishop without becoming an auxiliary bishop? A bishop of a diocese? Yes, right? you, you could. Can. Oh, you could yes. do that, right? Yes, sure, sure. I think Bishop Berjana came directly. He wasn't a... He was an auxiliary was, bishop. Was he, a, was he an yes, auxiliary? He was. Okay. Yes, he was. But there, there are many instances. For example, uh, just recently, if you recall, uh, down in Syracuse, Bishop Moynihan became the bishop and was ordained in late May. Now, he had not been an auxiliary bishop before. So okay. it's very possible to be a priest 
and then be ordained a bishop as the head of a diocese. Mm -hmm. uh, in my case, it was the other way, and I just found it very helpful to have been in that other uh, area okay. first. Yeah. Now, we knew that Bishop Rajana had, was reaching his 75th birthday. You can't make that a secret. We know it's going to happen two years from today. Yes. <clears throat> so they start to... Now, who's looking? The cardinal or the... Uh, the, uh, the apostolic nuncio. Apostolic, what is an apostolic nuncio? Yes. Well, uh, it, his title means he's the Pope's representative or ambassador. In the United States. The and United there's States. only one? Only one. Only one. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So he says we need a bishop. Yes, well, he looks ahead and he realizes that uh, the bishop will be re re resigning at, at a certain point. So then he begins to, uh, to put a process in place for selecting candidates. Eventually those names will go over to Rome, and then in Rome, the Congregation for Bishops examines those names and all of the material with them, and then makes recommendations to the Pope, okay. and the Pope chooses. Is it likely that... Uh, auxiliary Bishop uh, Laverde would have ever been appointed a bishop in Denver or in uh, San Francisco or would he be most likely in the East? Well, I, I think um, it's more likely that he, in this present uh, uh, area or time frame which we find ourselves, uh -huh. I, I found in the last 10 years or so now that um, it's been more likely for bishops to go long distances to be transferred. Is that right? Out. Yes. Now, at an earlier period, it was not as likely. Mm -hmm. okay. But in the more recent times, it has been. So, more recently, uh, an auxiliary bishop of Verdi could have gone to uh, wherever, you okay. know, in a sense. Well, I assume that when they were checking, they said, look, uh, there was a Paul Laverde who knew all about snow in Buffalo, this man's father, <laughs> so he probably would like snow himself, and he would be great to go up to Augsburg. You think that's what happened? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Do you, uh, did you ever hear of Ogdensburg before you were, were mentioned? Well, I, I, I had heard of Ogdensburg <coughs> from the viewpoint when I was in Rome studying. Mm -hmm. There were several men around my time to study with me from the diocese. Do you know who they are now? Oh, sure, sure. And uh, uh, Father uh, Poisson, now Monsignor Poisson, yes. he was two years ahead of me. And right ahead of me was Father Clyde Lewis. Is that right? Yes, yes. Peru for yes. many years. Yes. And behind me, uh, for the, right behind me, was Father James Shirtliff. And behind him, and I was still there, was Father Peter Butler, who died tragically some years ago here in the diocese. Okay. And um, there was also a, a man in, uh, in, in the um, fourth year class when I arrived. Um, and I don't, I don't think now he's actively serving as a priest. Okay. <coughs> so... Uh, you came and you were uh, installed here in uh, January 1994. You were probably were announced in October, November. Um, I got you can talk about the telephone yes. calls. Yep. You got. Okay. Yes. Yes. Well, yes. Uh, you don't forget these. And uh, the, uh, November 5th. At what time? Five minutes to two. <laughs> oh, I remember it very but well. But who's remembering yet? <laughs> oh, but I do. I had gone from Waterbury to Hartford to meet with the Archbishop on a particular matter. We were going to meet at two o'clock. And about five minutes to two, um, I was waiting, and the um, receptionist said to me, uh, Bishop, there's a call from you, a long-distance call. And I said, well, I'll take it in my office. Because I had an office in the Hartford Chancery, even though I was only there once a week. I spent most of my time in Waterbury. And no idea? No idea? Didn't, no, I had no idea. So I picked it up, and uh, it was, the, again, the, the apostolic pronuncio, this time a different one, because they had, there had been a switch in between. And it was Archbishop Cachavallan who said to me, after greeting me and saying hello and so forth, he said, the Holy Father is naming you Bishop of Ogdensburg. Do you know where Ogdensburg <laughs> is? And I said, well, yes, I do. I know it's in New York State. And that's as much as I knew. I had never really been here. And uh, again, he told me that, uh, that this would have to be confidential until November 11th mm -hmm. and, um, and so forth. So I remember that call very well. Does your heart flutter? Oh, you your whole life changes. Good. Did, were you looking forward to becoming a bishop of a diocese while you were auxiliary? Well, as an auxiliary, I was very happy in Hartford. Uh -huh. I really was. And I thought to myself, I could stay here all my life. It mm -hmm. would be wonderful because um, mm -hmm. I had those responsibilities in the region. I got along so well with Archbishop Cronin, with the priests, were wonderful to me. So in some ways, there, you know, I was pretty content. I, you know, uh, would I say yes to becoming the head of a diocese? I would. But I wasn't really, you know, I wasn't like yearning mm -hmm. to go. Mm -hmm. I could have stayed in Hartford. But again, my, my idea is, as I said to you earlier, um, when the Pope asked something, and so, mm -hmm. you know, by that time my mother was elderly, 
and she was then in the nursing. That's a factor. Home. Yes, I, I, you know, I, I realized, I, I realized a long time ago that if one becomes a priest or a sister or a brother, the first responsibility is to your duties. I love my mother very dearly, but she could not be the deciding factor in my life. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I had, um, I had made up my mind that whatever God asked I would do. So when the call came, I mean, I realized in saying yes, I was going to be moving from her and I knew she wouldn't mind it. And that her health was such that she couldn't move here. And uh, so I, I kind of knew it would be a great sacrifice for her and for me, and it was. But I felt that's what God wants and God will mm -hmm. see us through. And, mm -hmm. uh, it was tough. She mm -hmm. cried. She mm -hmm. minded my going. I'm sure. She really did. And she, I'm sure. Because I think she first thought she'd never see me again. Mm -hmm. Well, I assured her and, in fact, did see mm -hmm. her once a month. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> six years, give or take. Six and a half. You were auxiliary bishop. Uh, five and a half. Five and a half. Five and a half. Part. Yep. All right. Um, mm -hmm. the, uh, is this a short time? Is it average? Or is there any such a thing? It, yeah, it's There's hard no to thing. tell. I mean, you, you see some, some auxiliary bishops... Uh, are there maybe for a couple of years and become a bishop, and others are there 10 or 12 or 15 and then become a bishop. Mm -hmm. it, it's very hard. So it's not like a, an assistant pastor who says, uh, yeah. I better not join that club here because I've been here four and a half years and yes. I'm likely to leave. Yeah. In the no, next it's not like, that. not like that. No, huh? Not like no, that at no. all. No, you kind of go, if you're an auxiliary bishop, you're kind of there. Uh -huh. And the mindset, at least I had, was I'm an auxiliary bishop for the rest of my life uh -huh. unless the Lord intervenes in some way. Uh -huh. But that's where I am and that's it. Did you have a map handy and went right to it? Uh, didn't, want, didn't have one handy. Didn't no, have I didn't, one. No, in fact, it was a, another day or two before I could locate a map. Because when I came home from, uh, from Hartford, I had to go to a confirmation that evening. And so I was very much involved and have much uh -huh. time to think about uh, things like that. But then I looked it up and I found out that Ogdensburg was more north than I thought. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of people in New England, it's assumed that Buffalo, Rochester, and Ogdensburg are in a straight line. Yes, yes. I, yeah. And, all and but then you find yeah. out that no, Ogdensburg is, yeah. you know, is out. In fact, the, the, the kidding I do sometimes is that I can say I'm going south and still mean Buffalo. <laughs> it's right. You know, when they say we live in northern New York and yes. it's up near Poughkeepsie someplace, yes, you know. Yes. That's northern oh, yes, New that's York right. when you're talking people, to some people. Yes, yes. Well, we're going to talk to some people, but we're going to take a short break. I uh, hope you're enjoying our uh, a very pleasant discussion with uh, a very pleasant man. And remember, he's a man. He's not God himself. He's our bishop, and he's a great man, and, and he's got the frailties of man. Sure. He gets sick like, uh, like we all do, and he doesn't always have the best days, do you? No. <laughs> Every day is perfect. Tough days, but... Uh, uh, he, he's a man of God and a man of the people. Uh, Bishop Paul Stephen Laverde. Thanks. We'll be right back. You know, we talked about uh, titular bishops and auxiliary bishops. There's another word that we just talked a little bit off camera, an archbishop. Uh, tell us what an archbishop is. Okay. Um, our church is structured geographically across the world. And the way we structure ourselves is there's a, a certain portion of an area called the diocese and the bishop is in charge of that. Then several dioceses are configured together to form what we call a province. And every province has within it one archbishop and then the rest are bishops. And wherever there's an archbishop, his diocese is thereby an archdiocese. And the responsibilities of that archbishop would be to call the other bishops in the province together for meetings, to do a lot of collaboration. Nonetheless, every bishop in his own diocese is the head of it. In other words, the archbishop of, of New York, which is Cardinal O'Connor, or the archbishop of Hartford, who's now Archbishop Cronin, each of those could not tell the other bishops how to manage their diocese. Mm -hmm. But there is that system of cooperation. He calls the meetings. Okay. So, an archbishop is a bishop who is placed in charge of an archdiocese and has the responsibilities okay. of coordinating um, pastoral affairs with the other bishops of the province. So, the, arch, the diocese that he's the archbishop of, he's the bishop of that, yes, really. Yes, he's the head of that. Head of that as any other bishop. Right. But in addition to that, he has another title of archbishop which kind of puts him in charge of the other bishop, but don't tell him what to do. Now, let me just change that just yes, a little bit. Sure yes, sure does. No, he, um, he's archbishop of the archdiocese. Yes. All right. 
He, the, the word for him to call the other bishops together in collaboration is another word called the Metropolitan Archbishop. Oh, uh -huh. yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Now, Calvin's question was, when were you able to tell the Archbishop, did he have to wait those 10 days for you to tell him you were no, leaving? No, he didn't. No. What happened, when, when the papal nuncio calls a priest or or later on, in my case, an auxiliary bishop, to give them a new assignment by the Pope. He also calls the other two people who would be responsible. So he would call the, the bishop or the archbishop, and he did two minutes after he called me for Augsburg, he called Archbishop Cronin. He also then calls the bishop, for example, he called Bishop Rajan. Okay. Yes. So there's a few people that know. Okay. But, but the but idea of confidence is... <laughs> that's right. And the idea right. of confidence is not to, uh, to broadcast it. Okay. Uh, I assume when they decided that you were going to be bishop here, they were probably thinking of five or six other people who were just as qualified to be a bishop as you. Yes. And one of you were going to be here. But they, they may or may not have picked the best man, but they picked the best man that they thought of for this particular diocese. That must make a difference of where you're going. Well, I, yes, I, I would How assume. How you would fit in. Uh, yes, I would assume usually um, every office to be filled has what we call a turna, and that means from the Latin, three people are on the list. So probably, although I don't know this and would have no way of knowing that, but probably because that's the process. Uh, for the Bishop of Ogdensburg, three names were proposed to the Pope, and he picked one. I don't know who those others would be, I would never know mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. we, we, that's all kept confidential so as to to preserve the uh, the dignity and, mm -hmm. and so forth of everyone, mm -hmm. uh, but um, yes, yeah, so there would be three, and for whatever reason, the judgment was that I would be the best person at this time for the diocese of Ogden. Mm -hmm. We'll leave that to God to judge, but right, uh, okay, I'll do my best. Now, now, is it likely that you could be here? You could be here till you're 75, right. but it's also very likely that you could be transferred to another larger or not so demanding if your health wasn't good or something? It, that's possible? All that those happens. things are possible. I, I, I don't think I would want to say likely. Um, again, my understanding is that I'm going to be bishop here for the next 20 years until I'm 75. And that's what I plan. Okay. Now, you mentioned, for example, health. Well, God forbid I, my health is good, but I suppose if my health were to be mm -hmm. terribly poor, I would ask to resign, perhaps. Mm -hmm. uh, that were so, or, um, but short of that, I plan to be here. Okay. You asked if I could be moved to another diocese. It's possible, um, but I assure you, I'm not sitting here. If, no, <laughs> waiting. No. But if you get I that do. phone call, well, from I the, would treat. Yeah, I would treat any any phone call from the Pope the way I've treated them. I mean, that, that's 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 the, that's the kind of consistent thing in my life. I, you know, I'm old enough to remember when Bishop Rosanna came here. And I'm also old enough to remember that the bishops we had before, yes. several were transferred to bigger yes. parishes. Yes. And I really thought when he came here, and I've said to people, that he was coming here mm -hmm. as a, a waiting period to get back mm -hmm. to the Polish Diocese of, uh, of uh, Buffalo. He was a Polish bishop. He was Polish. Well, and there are a number of you know, uh, Polish Catholics in Buffalo. You know, and a lot of, a lot. It's a big, it's a big center. It's a good and I thought maybe government. that he would go back if he had been auxiliary. And they said, well, till that bishop would come here to get more training and whatever. Yes. But it didn't happen. No. We, I think he was the first or second only that ever retired from this diocese. Well, in our history, uh, what you have is the first four bishops uh, lived and died here, and then. All the, the next series up before to they could retire. Yes, because in those days we didn't have right. retirement. Oh, <laughs> so they all they all died here. Uh -huh. um, well, the first three um, I think died. Uh, there was no retirement, so they died even beyond the mm -hmm. age of seventy-five. Um, bishop Bodahan was young, but he he died after three years being our bishop. Then uh, Bishop McIntaggart and Bishop Kellenberg and Bishop Navo all were transferred to other sees. Bishop Smith came from Buffalo and was only here about five months. He came in May and died in October. And then um, Bishop Donnellan went to Atlanta, and then Bishop um, Regina stayed 25 years. A lot of this, you know, the way I see it, that's all tied up with the, the amazing providence of God. You know? mm -hmm. And in some ways, God, well, it's very true. God has a plan for each one of us, very different for each. 
but it all fits together and for whatever reason God sees in some some points that bishops move to several places and other places they're needed for a goodly amount of time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, just, I think we're, we're happy <coughs> as we leave things to God. Mm -hmm. uh, all of us. Bishop, have you always had the memory and the knowledge of names and the faces of people you've met as you do? You are, you are re reputed to know and don't forget names here that you haven't seen them for months and you can call people by name. Has that been something you've had over the years? Well, it's, it's there just to a degree. I think sometimes people are seeing Oh, they probably do. More, uh, more, uh, they emphasize it more than it is. I can, I can uh, if I work with someone a bit, I, I do remember the name and, and the face, even though I don't see them a lot. Um, but I, I, I would say that um, that's, you know, I place it halfway. Mm -hmm. There are some people I know that can meet somebody once and ten years later know them. I'm not like that. I'd, I'd have to have a little more experience <laughs> to be meeting. <laughs> well, I'm thinking, but I do try to. Uh, yes. I do try to remember people. Well, and, and you're an outgoing yes. person. And too. sometimes I remember the face and not the name or the name. Well, oh, I do that every day, <laughs> all the time. Right. I have trouble with it. There's a man who remembers names very well, and he he sees a lot of people, a a lots of people. And I try to tell him who it is by. Uh, what he looks like or how tall he is and he'll come up with the name. We did it on the way down today. That I, I couldn't remember the name and picked it off right away. Right away he picked it. Uh, Alright, when you heard you were coming here and uh, then you prepare. To, uh, yes, you have to bring everything to a close where you are. Uh -huh. So you have to start to uh, finish up files and, yep. and uh, write to some people. No, I won't be able to be there next April. No, and all of these things. Alright, let's get real personal on this one. You don't have to answer this one now. but uh, Alright, uh, you have, let's say you have a van, right? Yeah. A regular van. Could you put everything you own and was brought to our diocese in that van? Probably not. Probably not. A lot okay. of books. You, books. You have a lot of books. A lot of books. And uh, they didn't, they would not, well, we put all that in the van, we wouldn't be able to put much else. Is that because of the canon law you got involved with? Well, some of it, but it's just in different books, theology, mm -hmm. scripture, mm -hmm. uh, and things like that. Yeah. Um, I don't have a lot of furniture, so a lot of furniture didn't come. Mm -hmm. Some did, but not a lot. And I don't really. You don't have, have, a have lot to list it all, but I'm just wondering no. if you have to. But I probably one van wouldn't have done it. I think we would have to get a little bit more than one van. Okay, maybe two vans. Now, one thing you did bring with you, though, is your secretary, right? Uh, in a sense, is I that did. secretary you call? Uh, yes, secretary? in a sense. Although, again, that was that was kind of separated by a bit of a period of time. Um, when I became personnel director in Norwich back in 1985. I was looking to have a secretary in the office who would respect the confidentiality of those very delicate issues. So I said to the bishop, I said, I would, if I could, I would like to find a religious sister, religious brother that could do that. Um, and, and also because they'd probably stay a bit, you know, not a bit longer and so forth. But anyway, make a long story short, at that time Brother David had been teaching and was looking just for a brief change in his responsibilities, and I had known him. Well, he was able to come aboard as provincial as his own superior let him. So he came. Initially, he was only going to come for one year, and then one year became three. And then I got uh, transferred, and he actually stayed in the Diocese of Norwich almost another year. And he was ready to go back to his own duties of teaching. Now, in Hartford, the auxiliary bishops had not had a secretary. And after a while, I said to the archbishop, I said, you know, I, I really feel given my style and what I want to do, that it's very important to have somebody back at the office and so forth. And uh, I said, I wonder if I could find someone. I said, maybe even Brother David, because by then I had heard that Brother David was preparing to go back to the classroom. I said, I don't know if he prepared to come here or not, but could I ask him? He said, yes. To make a long story short, the superior let Brother come to Hartford. Now when I came here, again, we were not sure that, uh, first of all, I wasn't sure that it would be good to have him come here, but I was in preparing to arrive in that interim period, I did some reading of past meetings, and I found out that the uh, Council of Priests in the, Arch in the Diocese of Ogdensburg had recommended to Bishop Brujana a couple of years before I arrived that he might think in terms of getting a non-priest secretary Is that right? because of the shortage of priests. Mm -hmm. So I said to myself, well, they're already thinking of that, and that's very true. I do need priests in the parishes. In fact, if anyone's looked at my style, I am trying to put into positions of responsibility uh, a non-priest wherever that's possible so that I have priests for our parishes. So the point I'm making is that I already found a predisposition here to have a non-priest secretary. 
And then I asked brother if he were interested, and, and he checked with his provincial, the provincial would, uh, his period would allow him. All worked out well, so now he's here at least for a period of time. Okay. Yeah. So, and he, he could pretty near speak for you. He knows he what knows you're thinking. He knows my mind well. He knows yes. your mind very well, correct? Right? Yes. yes. He's very, again, a man of the church, very confidential. Mm -hmm. You can be assured that he, uh, he says nothing to anybody. Well, you want that. You know how that is. Well, <laughs> uh, I, I can say a very interesting, it's very human, but I, I, I say that when, when Brother first came to work for me, I said to him, one of the essential qualities is that you maintain confidentiality. And I'm going to tell you that if you should forget that and make a mistake, you will be forgiven, but you won't work here. <laughs> because that's how much I guard that. And I, and I ask the same thing for any group I'm with, you know, that when we're dealing with the lives of human beings, be very careful. Now, he's wonderful with that. I mean, he has a... He has a very favorite phrase he used to use a lot of Connecticut anyway. He would ask him something and say, didn't come across my desk. <laughs> well, we're, we're, we're covering some subject that you may not have thought we, we were going to, and I didn't know we were going to, but we're talking here about what happens and what our bishop has to go through. Um, he has a life of his own, but he has uh, someone here who's uh, with him all the time. And yes, he, when he travels with you when you go... Yes, he serves as master ceremonies and uh -huh. will, will, will accompany me and then the good thing is that he can drive the car and I can work in the back seat. Oh, you work or you work? Well, oh, I take all my work. You do? Read and answer letters. and You write in the car? Well, I, I can, I can, you, you uh, can dictate. You can? You dictate, dictate, yes, yes. And I can make some notes to myself. I wouldn't want to be able to, uh, to show my writing in the car to anyone else, <laughs> but I can read. You write well otherwise, though? Yeah, I, if I, uh, I, I scribble when I do. <laughs> things, but, uh, as long as I can read it. <laughs> uh, you're hearing more than reading today, folks, but we'll be right back. We're in Ogdensburg, New York, on this uh, snow on and off. It's, it's clear again. Uh, on the December 4th, a Monday afternoon, and uh, uh, we've we, we got a few more minutes here, and we had two hours here with the bishop set up, and we appreciate the time very, very much. Delighted. Delighted to be able to speak to so many good people. Very morning. good. Well, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay. Thanks very much. We'll be right back. I bet when Brother David told you we were going to be on television for an interview, you had no idea we were going to get into the things we are getting into. No, I really didn't know what you were didn't going to do. Didn't know I had any idea. No, no I'm, right. I'm always a We're going all right. We're all, no problem. All right, we're going to talk a little bit, I think, for you people, uh, some facts now. We're going to roll off some facts. Okay. And uh, we'll confirm them that, th that they are sure. correct as I know them. Um, I had 170 thousand Catholics, and you corrected me to a hundred and forty in our diocese. In our diocese, which uh, is one quarter of the state of New York. Which is in, in, in the area. That's right. Twenty-five percent of the state, and how? And what percentage of the, uh, the, of the population? Roman Catholic population, population we have two percent. Two percent. So we're twenty, one quarter, uh, twenty-five percent of the area of the state, and, and only two percent of the, because there's so much open land. That's right. right? And of four hundred and thirty thousand uh, population within the diocese. Yes. So a little bit less than, we're less than half. Oh yeah, less yeah, than half. Right. All right. Yeah. Uh, roughly, still very good. Yeah, well, roughly 12,000 square miles. Yes. We know it's the, we know, or I know, that it's the Lake Champlain and the border. Right. Go down below Ticonderoga? Just right? right, just below Ty. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you then go, you go zigzag across. Yes. Um, hitting places like Scroon Lake okay. and Old Forge. Uh -huh. and Wells and Speculator, all the way over to below um, Watertown, like Adams Center. Mm -hmm. And then, then you begin coming up along Lake Ontario. So Watertown is part of this? Yes, Watertown is part and of this. Everything else uh, inside the lake That's and, right. and the border. All the way up, then through uh, St. Lawrence Seaway, mm -hmm. all the way up to the top, and then the Canadian border. So you probably have, and you, you told me there were eight dioceses, there are eight dioceses in the state, in the state. of New York. Mm -hmm. Nobody has the area that you have no. to cover. No. So when you go to Ticonderoga, you've got a long trip. Three and a half to four hours. See, because part of the problem is, is, if you see it as a problem, I suppose it is in terms of if you want to move quickly, um, we have very few super highways. Mm -hmm. On the east, we have um, 87, mm -hmm. the north way. Um, on the west, we have a bit of 81 that goes just above uh, Watertown, almost into Alex Bay. Mm -hmm. But aside from those, there are no other four-lane highways. Yes. And there's no angled ones either. They go no. up and down. Yeah. And then across in the middle of the Adirondack Mountains. So if you're going to cross, you're going through the mountains. Yes. So there's no easy way. Okay. So I, su I suppose if we had a superhighway, 
I could make uh, Ticonderoga in a shorter time. Mm -hmm. But given we're the, what we have, it's about three and a half, four hours. Okay. What else I have is uh, 122 parishes within this area. The area. Of the diocese, yes. Oh, I think a good time here. To, parishes are within deaneries. What's a deanery? Well, a deanery is a geographical uh, unit that encompasses a certain number of parishes, and there's a priest in charge called the dean, and he has the responsibility in, in my name to, to gather priests together, discuss issues, to represent me, and so forth. Yeah. And when you, if you were staying overnight, you'd be staying at a deanery generally? Um, not, no, Don't normally have to be? You, what, what you do is you try to find uh, a rectory that has room, because not all the rectories would have enough room. Uh, I can think of a rectory that has lots of room. Great place for you to stay when you're in the Saranac Lake area. Yes. Huh? I Father Susie's got yes. some nice place. St. Bernard's Rectory. He's great got nice place. quarters, hasn't yes, he? Yeah? Nice quarters. Yes. <laughs> you know, that they, they say that the, the, that the ministers have their better halves, but some of the priests have better quarters. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say? Now that's, that's I've not heard this. You, gotta, you, you haven't heard that? You I have like to remember that. that you like that one? one. I like that one. Uh, yes. And certainly yes. Father Susie, who was yes. at uh, yes. six or seven yes. years in Champlain, uh, a great oh, priest. Know we, yes. Oh, we know him very well. And I was able to stop in and see him this past summer, and yes. he was showing me his uh, various sections up there, and yes. there were yes. about seven or eight priests. I think you were coming that night. I may well. You were been. coming that night. There was something going on. You were having a dinner in Saturday night, late that night. That probably was when I went around for the Bishop's Fun dinners. In August. Late August. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. You were coming that night. Yes. He got word when he got back that day you were on your way. Yes. Um, you see, the priest who built the new rectory there, uh, at some point. It may have been Monsignor Kellogg, but I'm not sure. But when he built it, he built it in such a way that it would be large enough to have priests be able to stop by. Yes. And so that's why... It's, it's a long way between, between long places way between to stay places, there, too. Yes. Right. yes, and of course, he, he don't even have to go outdoors to go to church. He has a, right. a, a hallway, right, in that's the right. school there, too. And of course, he's very good with the school children. All right, uh, how many deaneries do you have in the... Eight. Eight. And 28 missions. Yes, now these would be, these would be uh, uh, almost a parish, but not quite the status of a parish. Mostly summer? No, no, these are year-round. Year-round, huh? Yes, yes. Right. What would you call more? Is that a parish? Yes. It, and, but, but Father uh, has two parishes he's in charge yes. of. Huh? Our Father, yes, in fact, we have a lot of that in the in diocese, where one priest is the pastor of several parishes or a parish and several missions. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's how we're initially able to... Uh, to uh, relate with the shortage of priests. And once in a while, you have a retired priest yeah, who, who lives in residence. Who lives in residence, like in... Uh, like in Morris. Like in Morris, or uh, in Chiribusco. In Chiribusco, right? That's right. Father uh, McCaslin. Father McCaslin, and, yes. Uh, and you've got Father Rappin in Morris. Exactly. All right. Yeah. Nine oratories. Yeah, an oratory is really a, a, a church building that will be used occasionally for uh, prayer or for Mass. But um, it, it's not meant to be an ongoing place for worship. Years ago, these oratories were probably the, the parish church of a parish that's now is no longer existent. Mm -hmm. And so as we merge parishes, often, we don't always have to do it this way, but often we will take that former parish church, make it an oratory for a while, and use it just in certain circumstances. Okay. Schools, 24 elementary schools right. and two high schools. That's right. Uh, now, the other thing I read was 4,260 uh, bishops in the world, active and retired. Yes. Right? Uh, and they report, who do you report to? Right? Who well, is your boss? Really, uh, God, but... <laughs> well, that's right, but I know what you mean. Uh, my immediate superior in terms of accountability is the Holy Father. The Holy Father he appointed himself. me here and yeah. therefore I'm accountable to him. Mm -hmm. So that, that's whom I am truly accountable to. Mm -hmm. Now, in his name, the Apostolic Nuncio would often, uh, would often uh, interact. Mm -hmm. And because we have a special relationship in every province, the bishops with the Archbishop, certainly Cardinal O'Connor is a, a very particular person in my life. And, but, but in terms of if you want to know who is in that sense, my mm -hmm. one I'm accountable to, mm -hmm. it's the Holy Father. Now, the Cardinal, then, is not in charge of uh, a certain number of bishops? or No, no not no, at all. Huh? No, the, the role of the Cardinal is to be an advisor to the Holy Father, and the chief role of Cardinals is to elect the new Pope when, when, when the Pope That's dies. It. Okay. Yes. But they're a great source of counsel to him. It would be, oh, I wouldn't say it exactly this way, but in, in a sense, 
what the cabinet is to the president, to the College of Cardinals would be to the Holy Father. Okay. There are 11 in the United States? Um, there are 11 U American cardinals. They don't all live in the United States. Uh -huh. uh, we, we have in Rome, if I'm not mistaken, we have two American cardinals in Rome. We have a Cardinal Shoka, who's in charge of the financial office of the Holy See, and we have Cardinal Baum, who's in charge of, who's the Grand Penitentiary of, of, of the Holy See. So we have two in Rome, and I think the other nine are in the United States. They're not in charge as such of a diocese? Oh yes, all, all the cardinals in the United States um, are archbishops of a diocese. They Several are. now are retired, so they're no longer active. Okay. But yes, um, for example, Cardinal O'Connor, he not only is a cardinal, but he's also the Archbishop of New York, Cardinal okay. Law, Archbishop of Boston, and so forth. But if uh, Cardinal Spelman, Spel no, no, no uh, O'Connor, Connor. Well, Spelman Cardinal been, Spelman was there, been but, dead, but, but he's been dead a few years. Uh, now, yes. Cardinal O'Connor, if he were to no, either retire or, or pass away, yes. he wouldn't necessarily have to be replaced as a cardinal, he could be replaced as an archbishop, by an archbishop? Yeah, the successor to, uh, to for example, as you say, uh, when uh, Cardinal O'Connor retires, um, his successor will be named Archbishop. That's right. Um, one would, would almost foresee, though, that whoever is appointed Archbishop would in time be named a Cardinal. So they would pick him with, with that in mind? I believe so. Yes, I <laughs> believe right. so. Especially if those of those particular archdioceses that have had traditionally cardinals. Yes. And there are 45 archbishops in the United States. Yes. You gave me that figure. Yes. From and again, a couple of them would be Americans who have other posts. For example, the, um, the, archbishop, in, uh, the um, archbishop in charge of communications mm -hmm. for the Vatican. Um, he lives in Rome, but he's okay. an American. Yes. Now, I can't even archbishop pronounce the word, but licentiate? Oh, licentiate. Licentiate. A licentiate. Degree in yeah. canon law. What, what is a licentiate degree? A licentiate uh, is a degree that would be similar, but not exactly equal to what we call a master of master's degree in, in the United States. Okay. And uh, this is a degree that is um, earned in, in church disciplines. So one could have a licentiate in canon law, one could have a licentiate in theology. And as you say, I, 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 I went to study at Catholic University for my licentiate in canon law, and when I finished in Rome theology, I also had a theology, uh, licentiate theology. Okay. He pulled into a master's degree. Easy. You know, the headline here said that Hartford bids a tearful goodbye to Bishop Laverde, and you can see why. And uh, they, <laughs> certainly our gain was, was their loss, and uh, they, they were probably very happy with you there, and they, they always hate to see a priest yes. transfer even. Well, that, that's you it. Know, they I mean, become that, that's part of our count. family. That's right. Whenever a priest who's loved and respected leaves a parish, people are very sad, and we can understand that. Quite. And that's true for a bishop. It's, there are some priests I heard that leave, they don't cry. Well, <laughs> that rarely, happens. I think. Rarely, rarely, very rarely, right? Yes. But that happens, you know. They just, yes. they just aren't, uh, there's not a mesh with that particular yes. Di uh, yes. parish for whatever yeah. reason. Sometimes yeah. it's temperament. I mean, we, we sometimes find, we all have our different temperaments, and mine is, thanks to my parents, you know, I'm very outgoing and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've known uh, priests, but, uh, but others too, you know, whose temperament initially is very quiet or very somber. And actually, when you get to know that person, there's a wonderful person beneath. But okay. it takes a little while to, to right. get to know them. All right, uh, we're going to take a break. Just after I ask uh, uh, the bishop this one question, he's sure. not going to answer. I'm going to see if he'll answer. Maybe he don't want to answer. I understand that when you first came, you made it quite clear to all your, your priests that it was your uh, wish that the uh, liturgy not be changed in any way. You wanted the liturgy to be the same in all the parishes. And you don't want them to put in their own little things like it has been happening over the years. We'll let you see if you want to discuss that or not discuss when that. we come back. Sure. Sure. Stand. Hope you're still with us. We're now going to find out is he or is he not going to answer the question or and to what extent. Yes, I'd be glad I don't to put you on the question. spot on that. You're not. No, you're not. The liturgy of the church is the public prayer of the church. And as such, it is given to us as bishops and priests to lead, to preside over, to uh, assist the people in praying. Now, uh, I, I think it's important to note that in our liturgy, since the Vatican Council, there are a number of things that are optional. 
and there are some things that are very essential. So, you can find some differences because there are some options that a priest may choose to do or not to do on a given day. Or, you know, there are some optional things. But they're provided within the, the framework. Okay. My point is that as a bishop and, and as a priest, priest, we all need to take very carefully and seriously the directives of the liturgy. Where there's an opportunity for option, we're free to choose those. But we're not free to choose anything that is not an option, and therefore there are certain essential things that ought to be, and in my estimation, must be followed. The liturgy is not the private uh, prayer nor the private preserve of any one of us. And you're right, I did say to the priests that I expected them to celebrate the liturgy according to the directives of the church. Now, as I say, sometimes people don't understand the options and can be thinking, well, you know, because Father Jones does it this way, how come Father Smith, uh, whoever, might be doing it a different way? Um, and when people ask me, I try to find out what is the issue they're talking about to see. There might be the availability of, a, of an option. For example, you were mentioning the offertory procession during the break. Well, I, in some ways, the option is you can come from the back, you can come from the side, you can come from midway. Um, it's highly recommended on Sundays and Holy Days. Um, it may not be done in the weekday. So those are all kind of optional things. But there are other things that, that are strictly there. For example, the, the Eucharistic prayer, the prayer the priest prays in the middle of the Mass out loud on behalf of all of us. Now, that prayer should be the prayer that is provided in the text. No word one for of word. Us, yes. No one of us should be changing that and putting in our own interpretations and expanding. That is not ours to change. And I asked the priests to, to say, I want to support our priests and all that they can do. Because so often uh, they are beleaguered by many pressures around. Priest life is not easy. And as their bishop, I want to support them. I want to encourage them. And I've asked them, uh, no secret, I've asked them to, to do the liturgy as we are expected to do it so that I can support them in that. But if, if, if one of them should choose not to, I can't support someone in something that, that uh, you know, he is not doing. Um, now, I presume that by and large everybody is doing well. I'm not around everywhere. But you asked the question. Did I say that to mm -hmm. the priest? I did. Mm -hmm. um, because that's my responsibility. I mean, I'm the, as the bishop, I am the, the chief liturgist, um, the chief teacher, so that means that I have a, I, I, that's my responsibility, and I, I won't shirk from my responsibility. But, I, but I, I do think that most of our priests see the wisdom in that, too, because um, we are given a liturgy to pray. It has so many beautiful options, too. I mean, you know, it, we don't have to feel like we, we're always um, in the one, in a rut, so to speak. There are many wonderful options mm -hmm. within it. But all of us, beginning with me as bishop, we have a responsibility to take that liturgy as presented and to pray it with faith, beautifully, prayerfully, reverently, joyously, but as the church wants. You know, back... So there, I answered your yeah, question. Yeah, absolutely, degree. thank you very much. Uh, it, it came as a surprise, too, believe me. I, we, nothing's been rehearsed, believe me. There, I certainly have anybody have an option, particularly the bishop, to say, I, I don't want, I can't answer that, uh, yeah. I'll think about it or something, yeah. but he hasn't so far. We don't prepare questions and we take breaks, either. that's not our reason for it, as you know. Um, I can remember, I'm one of the older ones in the parishes now, and I remember we all had a missalette. We all went yes. to school, to church with our missal. And they don't want us to do that anymore. Well, I think there's a reason for that. First of all, um, years ago, we had the missalette or the missal because the language was Latin, mm -hmm. and we didn't understand that. Also, the priest faced away from mm -hmm. it. I think now, uh, what we try to see is the liturgy is the, liturgy of, uh, it's the prayer of everyone who participates, but each person in his or her own role. So as a priest, I have a very definite role, but the, the people of God, the lay people, have a definite role. The deacon has a definite role. Right? So in terms of, of the language, because it's English, we're asked mainly to try to listen. For example, if, if someone is proclaiming the gospel, and we try to train our electors to do that well, mm -hmm. priests and deacons as well. Well, if he's proclaiming, there's something about proclaiming the word to listen. 
you know? Like you and I are talking. It would be very different if we had a script here and I was just mm -hmm. reading to you mm -hmm. from it, you know? Absolutely. You'd say it's not too engaging. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why we try to have people steer away from using missiles and missilettes. It's because now it's the language of the people and you, you engage your hearing response. You know, I've been active. But it takes an adjustment. Oh, yeah. I've been active in our church for many, many years, uh, close to the priests. And I remember Father Seguin uh, absolutely forbade, forbade for people to bring any notes to the lectern. He said, you can't do that. He said, if you don't know your topic, you shouldn't be talking. Yeah. He said, can you imagine, he said, a, a Ford salesman? You asked about the car? He said, let me see here. He said, it's got eight cylinders. Yeah. He said, you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't. <laughs> he said, it's exactly what he said. And he said, if you do it poorly, that's one thing. But he said, do it without yeah. notes. That's what he said. That's what he wanted when, when people came. Uh, this, uh, just a little bit about the Diocese of Augsburg. I have something here yes. of how your diocese, the diocese is made up. Yes. Uh, we're in the bishop's house. That's right. Here. Now, is this strictly the residence here? It's, yes. This is you the have residence. an office here? In and the I have my office here too. So someone's going to meet with you, they meet yeah, here? They meet here. I, don't have an, I do not have an office in the chancery next okay. door. Okay. This, this is a meeting room here yes, for also. the bishop when you yes. meet with right. various people. Right. Where we are, I meet individuals, I also meet groups here. Okay. Yes, right. The next building over is, our, is the chancery, chancery office. office. So what does that mean? What is that building? Chancery really means the... the uh, office building of the bishop, and we have in there various uh, offices that represent me. For example, um, we have the tribunal is located there. Um, the more narrow understanding of the chancery, where you have the Monsignor O'Coin, who's in charge of, of various aspects of our diocese, and Monsignor Murphy, who is in charge of the pastoral agencies. We have over there, to the, the education. Okay, Department of Education. Right. Uh, Monsignor Lawrence Dino from right. West Jay's office is in uh, he, he's in there. Right. Uh, and then the Bishop's Fund Appeal is there. would be there. That's right. Uh, the Bureau of Information That's right. would be there. That's right. A stewardship office. Right. It's Plan giving okay. stewardship. Bishop's Matrimonial Fund. Tribunal. Yeah, that's the tribunal that, that's, that's over there. Building, yes. Okay. And our, all our fiscal offices, our financial offices are there right. too. Director of Priests and Pastoral Personnel. Yes. That, well, that's that's the, the personnel. What does that mean? What, what well, does Monsignor Dennis Pray, do pray. Yeah, has the same responsibility as I did as uh, when I was in Norwich. That is, uh, he represents me in terms of the personnel of the priests mm -hmm. and their assignments and uh, transfers and things okay. like that. Okay, so like he and the the uh, the uh, organization of priests. That, uh, what do they call the Senate? The other? Oh no, we have a council of a priests. Council of that's priests. different. The council of priests is a consultative body to me. Oh, to you. So that when you're going to transfer somebody or someone to be transferred. We'll get two different things there. Oh, I okay, yeah. I beg your pardon. The Council of Priests is consulted to me on, on the affairs of the diocese, of the pastoral dimensions of our people. Um, Monsignor Dupre does work with what we call Committee on Assignments, and that gets into personnel changes of the priests. Okay. They're two different groups. So that the, oh, all right, all right. But then you have another group set up, like four or five priests that, for transfers. Yes, it's called Committee on Assignment of Personnel Board. And those priests are elected by their peers. In I, I, I remember I told Father Susi when I saw him, he's very, he's very fortunate to have the new pastor in Lake Placid being such a nice friend of his. Yes, that was <laughs> that, a nice move. That was a nice move for him. unintended by me. I know, but I said, what a nice move. Worked and then, well. of course, when, when Father Morgan came to Champlain, yes. uh, uh, we said, uh, I told him, I said, why would you want to leave West Jay Z? He said, well, because they asked me. That's right. And uh, one of the recommendations on that, of course, was from uh, the Jay Z. Uh, I can't even think of his name so quick enough here. Brother Gardner. Brother Gardner. Gardner. We, just because we don't go see, we, we think of him often, you know. Yes, yes. But he said that that was one of his recommendations, and a very good choice, by the way. He's yes. loved by us as much as he was yes. in West Jay Z. Yes. Um, okay. The, then we have a building beyond that building. Okay. And what is yes. in that? Well, that, that's an additional chancery office, but because the building was given by the Spratt family, we call it the Spratt Memorial. But it's kind of an extension of, of, the, of our chancery office. And in that building, for example, you have the, uh, um, our, our office for liturgy, and we have our office for the missions. Um, we have the office of vicar for religious, and we have the uh, Christian formation program, uh, the office for the Christian formation. So that's all over in that building, okay. as now, well as our diocesan insurance. The family, it, like is John Middleton, that, that's called... Now, Dr. Middleton, who heads the Family Life Office, he doesn't have an office here. He, no. He okay. works out of the place in Shazy. And that's a diocesan-wide office that he Yes, has. I mean, he yeah. has the office, okay. yes. Um, 
about how many people do you have in the uh, Diocese of Augsburg, in, in Augsburg, give or take? Uh, give or take, I'd say about 30. About 30, that's right. Because yes. okay. we have a number of secretaries and uh-huh. assistants. You know, up until the time I came here, the last time two years ago, to talk with uh, Bishop Rajana, I didn't know that Bishop didn't live in the house next to the uh, cathedral. The cathedral, that's yes, where I thought yes. they were. Yeah. No, the Bishop of Augsburg has lived in this house since the very first. So I hear. So we go back to 1872. The house antedates the bishop, though. The house probably is around 1860. But previous to that, we were in the Diocese of Albany. Yes. Right? Albany, in the area. Diocese of Albany. Yes. yes. I was going through some of our records yes. for the cemetery, and it shows that the Diocese of Albany yes. bought the land originally right. for it, you know. Sure. Um, sure. Well, tell us your impression uh, of uh, Ogdensburg when you got here and how it's changed since you've been here, if it has. Well, I really very much in love with, with, with the people and the area here because um, I, I find the people in the Diocese of Augsburg so wonderful. They truly are. You know, they, they work hard. They try very hard to raise their families. They're just good, decent, God-fearing people. I, I just, just love it here. And I, as I said to you at the very beginning, this, um, this territory reminds me so much of the territory of mm-hmm. Eastern Connecticut. Mm-hmm. So I'm very much at home here. There are some challenges here in our diocese. For example, there, we have in our diocese of Ogdensburg some of the poorest areas in the whole state. There are a lot of truly poor people in the diocese. Um, now they work hard; they try to work hard on it, but but nonetheless, because of the, there's limit, there is a limitation of opportunity and so forth. Now we don't always see that, but if you drive your country roads, mm-hmm. you see patches of real poverty. So that's a challenge to me. A challenge to have people who are poor maintain their dignity, because every person has dignity. Every person. You know, Bishop, when you mentioned that, someone said to me one time, they said, wouldn't it be nice to be rich? I said, if you live up here, you are rich. We just don't have money. That's right. Uh, there are very very rich people right. up here, right. but without money. That's right. Uh, this is a great place, I oh, think, uh, you know. The beauty of the land. The, the, the whole thing. Oh, uh, it's just beautiful. Uh, yes. But... Uh, but there are people who do struggle in terms of earning oh, a yes. living. Oh, yes. Know? And that affects, of course, your operations too, yes, right? It does. Uh, it does. But you know, I notice that even people in need give more, give generously to those less in need. It's a wonderful mm-hmm. when you see that. It reminds you of the, of the widow in the gospel who gave her last mm-hmm. penny. To your bishop that. appeal doing very well? It will be very well. I'm very pleased with that. People are cooperating very, very well with that. Well, yeah. this, this year, you apparently came up with some kind of a goal for yeah, each well, parish. We thought that it would be helpful for each goal to know its fair, of each parish to know its fair share. Uh, and so we assigned the goal to each parish to ask them if they would meet that. Because it kind of represents, and it's a complicated formula, but it kind of represents their fair share toward this. Mm-hmm. Because it's a, it's a min, there are ministries and agencies for everybody, and we all need to cooperate in that as according to what we can. Do all dioceses have this kind of a, of a drive? Yes, most dioceses. I, most dioceses have a, the kind of a drive we have, and a good number of them, I wouldn't say all, but a good of them also have goals for the parish. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We may not have met our goal today, what we were going to cover. We really had no way to go. We'll take a short break and get our things together. We're approaching our, our end of our two-hour period. We'll come back and say goodbye to the bishop and see what we might cover in a very short time. Sure. Right. You know, we've mentioned... Bishop Brazana's name a couple times and how we saw him two years ago and I haven't even been smart enough, ask, enough to ask how he is and what did you hear from him? Well, I was just talking to him a couple of days ago on the phone. I had seen him though, you know, when the Holy Father came down, came over I should say, uh, from, from Rome over to our country in October. Bishop Brazana went from Buffalo to New York. I met him in New York and we both went to Baltimore to be with the Holy Father. I find the bishop in good health good spirits. He's working hard in Buffalo. Doing he, what? Doing confirmations. He is. Yes, he did a goodly number in the spring and he did about eight or ten now this fall. And his spirits are good and he always asks about the diocese. He's very faithful. And I, I'd like to say publicly as I did initially, but can say it now with two years of experience. Um, we owe so much to Bishop Rajana for his 25 years here. You know, there were years that were tough, they were turbulent. The church was changing in many ways. And the image I have of the bishop is that he was like that wonderful pilot on a ship that's in the midst of storm-tossed waters. And he set the rudder and he kept everything going. 
and I owe personally to him so much, and we all do, and I, um, I can't thank him enough for the rich heritage of faith that he um, has left us. Uh, Wonderful man. And I, he, one of the last things he did here in the diocese was to t talk with us for yeah, an hour and a half to two hours. Please give him galvanized regard. I will. Because tell I'm him we were thinking about him. Tell him you, you, after two years, you've already been on TV for okay. a couple hours with Hometown Cable. Uh, we did mention off camera, and I forgot about it, talk a little bit about something about Christmas. What's well, in, what's, what do you want to talk about? Well, I just would like this opportunity, such a marvelous opportunity to reach people. See, I, I find the media so important to ministry. If we want to do evangelization, we have to use the media because that's how you reach out. You know, and you need to do mm -hmm. that. So, this is a marvelous opportunity. I'm so grateful, both of you, for this opportunity to say to the people who are watching this program that um, I, I offer them my prayers and my wishes for a Christmas that's filled with real hope and true peace. We, we desire that so much in our hearts. And the one to bring it is Jesus. God sent his son that we might have life. And the Lord won that life for us ultimately by dying on the cross and rising again. And Christmas is the first chapter in that beautiful history of bringing new life and an ending life. So my prayers for everyone who is watching is they have a wonderful Christmas filled with God's peace and hope that will engender for them new meaning and purpose in the new year. Thank you, Thank you so much. much. It's Thank been a pleasure for Hometown Cable, Calvin and I, to be here with Bishop Laverde. And let me just make one wish as we get, approach the new year. If you hear that Bishop Laverde is going to be in your area, anybody who's watching this, going to be in your parish, going to be in a nearby parish, uh, please go and meet this man face to face. Uh, here's a person that <laughs> I'm not going to look at him, he's smiling because <laughs> and I, I sincerely believe this. Uh, the one time I met him in Champlain uh, at a dinner, and, and he don't forget you. And uh, anybody who has met the man would be very pleasant. If you just go and listen to him, he is a, a pleasure. Uh, we were commenting that uh, we've probably seen more of Bishop Laverde in two years than we saw the Bishop uh, Brazana in 25. But uh, uh, you said you're a younger man than I'm he was at man. the end. One has to uh, uh, remember that but, uh, when I get to be up in my late 60s and 70s, I don't know if I'm going to be able to run around as well. Much. I'll probably yeah. won't want to see you anymore because I want to be 20 years older too. Like and uh, but we all have our temper. <laughs> we sure know. have. We yeah, hope to be uh, to meet the bishop again and, to, and talk a little bit more about our diocese. Maybe in a. I'd be uh, glad to do that. Uh, sometime sure. he's in our area. We might get an hour or so in. And sure. but in the meantime, we thought we should know uh, is Paul Laverde Jr. Probably. No. 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 I have Steve, and my father did. He didn't have that. Okay, Paul Laverde. Uh, the second here, uh, the, the son of Paul Laverde Sr. from Sicily, and, uh, as a person, and this is, and a bishop is a person, number one. Uh, he asked how he should dress when we got here, and he's pr dressed perfectly. He's, uh, you're, you're a man of God, and you're a man yes, of, our, yes. of your people. I didn't know whether he wanted me to wear this or my cassock, but... Be I'm yourself, and, and you have been yourself. Sure. Uh, Bob Venn, Hometown Cable, will see you next Sunday with new and different things. And uh, we, if you've got any stories you'd like us to cover, uh, please talk to us. This whole thing, there won't be anything cut, uh, Bishop. Mm, thank you. They're going to be, they're going to see all they want. Maybe you won't want to see him. But what they he, see is what they get. Huh? That's right. If it comes in your area, go and tell them Bob sent you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks much for watching Hometown. Good. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you too.